Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. My name is Rob Woods and this is the show for anyone who works in charity fundraising and who wants ideas for how to raise more money, enjoy their job and make a bigger difference even during the pandemic. And if you'd like to help colleagues in other departments buy into a particular way of helping your charity, then I hope you're going to find this an interesting episode. Because today we're looking at silo smashing and ideas for how to share important concepts across teams within a charity. In particular, we're focusing on legacy giving and ideas for achieving culture change within your charity. This is the second half of an interview I carried out with Dr. Claire Rapley, who's one of the UK's leading experts in legacy giving. I met Claire in early March 2020 at the excellent conference organised by the National Association of Hospice Fundraisers, and it was just a couple of days before the UK went into full lockdown. If you'd like to hear my first interview, which is all about ways to make it easier to talk about legacies with your supporters, I shared that in episode 28. Today, though, we're talking about a piece of research that Claire carried out on behalf of the National Trust about how to increase interest in promoting legacies across a charity. Claire explains the three key themes she discovered and brings these to life with examples of specific tactics that charities have used in their change management programs. Just before we start, I want to reiterate that this was recorded in early March and clearly the world has changed a great deal since then. Nevertheless, when listening back this week, I found so many of these ideas are as relevant as ever, both in terms of legacy awareness and more widely in terms of breaking down siloed thinking. I hope you find the tactics and ideas that we discuss are helpful. This episode of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast is brought to you by the Bright Spot Members Club. As a practical alternative to one-off conferences and courses whose impact can fade all too quickly, the Members Club is an online resource that gives you ongoing access to a whole library of video training courses, monthly coaching webinars and live training events. It's all designed to help you learn, enjoy your job and raise more money. To join the 300 fundraisers already in the club, or just to find out more, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk. Hello again, Dr. Claire Routley. Hello. So here we are for the second half of my conversation with Dr. Claire Routley to do with legacy fundraising, but the, the slant on this one is going to be different from the last episode. The context is that we are both here to speak at the very excellent National Association of Hospice Fundraisers Conference. And I was just having a really interesting chat with Claire in the lobby just now and couldn't resist seeking her views on a really valuable topic for the listeners to the podcast. And in a moment, I'll tee it up for, for why I think it's so important. But just a, a little context, if in case you didn't hear the previous episode, which is more about how to have a conversation about gifts in wills with your supporter, any kind of support, a community, major donor, a marathon runner, that was the last episode. But before we get on to this particular episode, Claire, your company is called uh, Legacy Fundraising. Uh, you've been, you've worked in fundraising for 15 years, mm -hmm. including as a trust fundraiser. Uh, and now your specialist focus is in legacy fundraising. Is that right? Yes. Yes. In a slightly backwards way, I did my PhD in legacy. Worked out it was really interesting. <laughs> and then actually moved to work in that area. So Fantastic. And... The bit of research you mentioned, I really piqued my interest because, as I understand it, the National Trust asked you to do a piece of research, not so much to do with legacies pure, but into organisations that manage to um, get this notion of legacy fundraising being a normal thing to talk about across departments. They were curious about how to make an organisation maybe be more holistic in mm -hmm. their approach to legacy fundraising. Can you tell me a tiny bit about what that research was and particularly what the methodology was of that mm. research? Yeah, we were basically looking at organisations that were doing this well, that were being successful in uh, integrating that legacy message across the rest of the organisation. And so we did a quick literature review. Uh, and then the exciting bit really was we went out and talked to people that we knew were really good in this space and also got them to recommend other organisations that were good at this. And I suppose the literature review really was just to say, you know, some of this stuff 
is really good change management, actually. As you were saying, Rob, it just a lot of this applies much wider than just the legacy sphere. So we were able to back up what people were telling us with um, some more sort of academic evidence as well, really. And I suppose I should say anything that I say in this podcast, I have to say a huge thank you to National Trust for uh, you know letting us share some of this with the sector more widely, to my colleague Christine Reedy, who uh, worked with me on it, and to actually the, the brilliant legacy fundraisers that are doing this really well, because, you know, People were, were doing work that was, you know, far more sophisticated, to be honest, than I was expecting to find when I when I started. And like I said, work that really kind of aligns with what change management tells us is good as well. So mm. it's all credit to them rather than me, really. <laughs> and if the listener works in a fairly small organisation and there's only three of you in an office, mm. maybe this is, is not a massive deal because you really, I hope, all three of you are driven primarily by the overall outcome Mm. we're trying to make for our beneficiaries and therefore how finances and successful fundraising can achieve that so you you you, it may not feel hard that we need to be talking to each other and and the overall goal of of more satisfied supporters and therefore more long-term and generous supporters who might help in several different ways both as a major Mm. donor and leaving a gift in their will that all might might feel fairly easy if, mm. if you're in a, a smaller organisation, or it might not. But my experience <laughs> is in medium-sized and large organisations, the, the truth is it's much harder than most people think it will mm. be to help people think bigger picture rather than just focusing on what they thought their job was to do, which is to raise major mm. gifts or bring in corporate partnerships or get people running the marathons or get legacies. The very most successful fundraising organisations are donor focused and they have a culture, therefore, that is holistic about helping the donor do what they want to, to care about mm. this cause rather than being silo-ish and what any given internal target might appear to want. So I think whether the listener is, is a legacy fundraiser or not, I, I'm so fascinated to hear as to what you discovered mm are the things that the successful organisations manage to do if they are to break down these silos Mm. and get people across the organisation and outside of it talking about something like legacies? Yeah, yeah. So I suppose to summarise it, really, there were sort of three key areas that um, came up. So there was uh, people and how you go about sort of talking with, engaging with your colleagues, um, then communications, so looking at that whole area of, um, you know, how do we communicate these messages out internally? I mean, obviously, those two are interrelated uh, to, a, to a high degree, but uh, they were two sort of clear themes, I suppose. Um, and then the final one was around sort of measurement and how you actually measure effectively what's what's happening within, um, obviously, for this study, legacies particularly, and how well it's been integrated. Fantastic. So do you want to jump jump into that first theme mm. of people and tell me about a, an organisation or two that you discovered was doing this pretty well and some of the tactics that you really liked that they were, mm. they were using? Uh, well, at the core of it really was having somebody uh, who was sort of leading on this project, I suppose most probably the legacy fundraiser, but who was really passionate about this stuff. So um, I loved, uh, actually one person said to me that um, internally they call him Dan Dan the legacy man, because whenever, you know, there's a team meeting or, you know, he bumps into you in the in the kitchen, he's there sort of really, uh, you know, bigging up legacies, telling little stories. Um, and actually, I went to Australia last year and um, I was t- talking about Dan Dan, the legacy man. And somebody was like, oh, my goodness, they call me Esther the Bequester over here. So um, tip number one, have a name that rhymes with something legacy related is a good start. But, you know, have that passionate person. And I suppose to have the courage to admit if it's not you, you know, if you are the legacy lead, but, you know, you find it really difficult to go and... Um, um, sort of engage with your colleagues or big it up, whatever it might be. You know, find that that passionate person that's going to lead on this internal engagement project for you. Mm, great tip. So it is true that in personality wise, some people find it much more enticing and enjoyable mm. to be endlessly out and about in the corridors and having chats, mm. doing small talk. And if that's not you, but your organisation really needs to get legacies on the map, mm. then it's fine for it not to be you, but 
who who else could play that role on your behalf? Mm. Thinking that through uh, sounds like a, a, a good tip. Uh, what else in terms of the theme of people did you notice was going on when this was working successfully? So um, the people that were very good at this were then basically saying, well, who are the, the champions internally? So your sort of wider core group, really. Um, and uh, I'm not quoting exactly because uh, I was I forget exactly how they phrased it but someone said you know find those passionate people internally that do everything you know if there's a organization bake sale they'll be there with baking the cakes and um so that's not necessarily you know the chief executive or the chair of trustees it's sometimes it's the person on reception that's been there for 20 years and knows everything about everybody and it's that you know happy smiley face you see in the morning type person so so that's a really interesting point quite be be a student of the, for want of a, a better word, the politics and the power dynamics mm. across your organisation. And sometimes it, it will be in line with the formal hierarchy. And sometimes there's some other people who are not heads of team, but apps actually are also in a loud way or in a quiet way, mm. are strong characters that other res others respect. And you're saying when organisations were good at this, they found the right yeah. champions and talk to them one to one, help them understand, meet their objections and help them understand what it was we were asking you to do. And, and then the more formal cultural change efforts succeeded because people were on side and people who mm. had influence were on side. Yeah, they essentially, the, the advice to us was that those people then essentially kind of bring the, the vast majority of the organisation along with them. And what was interesting, not everybody, but some people were sort of formally appointing these people as champions. Um, so one organisation would have some formal recognition, it would give them a mug as you know, legacy champion. And they said they really appreciated that, actually, that sort of that internal recognition. But, you know, not everybody. Sometimes it, that was a... a a looser, more informal structure. All of that said, I'd love to move on to theme number two that you mentioned, which is broadly ways of communicating yeah. the fact that you would love people across the organisation to understand what legacies are and be able to do their bit in this area. A couple of things you noticed that were done well in this area, mm. both sort of conventional and obvious things, and also maybe there's some standout yeah. things that you thought, well... Of course that worked. You, <laughs> yeah. you could hardly ignore that. Yeah. So um, in terms of sort of the standard things, including legacy from, in induction was quite good. So, you know, right from the entry into the organisation, people were um, socialised into understanding that this was an important income stream, that it was it doesn't come from the legacy fairy, but it's actually fundraised and, you know, an important part of these relationships that they hold. So having it there from sort of day day one or at least the first week is uh, is great. Um, legacy training, again, um, the idea of giving people, and I'm paraphrasing from the wonderful Stephen George here, but tools and confidence around legacy conversations so that, you know, you're breaking down some of those those worries or barriers that, that they have. Um, but I think the really fun thing uh, that we uh, talked to people about was legacy awareness weeks. So um, a lot of people were aligned with, you know, the Remember a Charities Awareness Week, which happens in September, which is sort of external facing. You know, a lot of people were taking that and thinking about how do I use this as an internal engagement opportunity. Some people were having their, their week or sometimes even their month, you know, a different time of year. But it sort of makes sense, I think, to align with when the sector generally has been a bit more noisy around this. So um, having some sort of internal awareness period, focus period, and... Again, people were doing lots of interesting things there. So um, taking over the internal intranet, uh, sending around quizzes, um, Qu chocolate quizzes on Quizzes about legacies or quizzes yeah, about... Yeah, all the fun things about, you know, uh, unusual wills or sometimes, you know, unusual gifts that the organisation had had. You know, so much so much kind of interesting mm -hmm. uh, meat there in, in legacy. Um um, there's actually, this wasn't this study, but someone mentioned at one of the IOF's legacy special interest groups recently, which I thought was amazing. They did um, a, a story. I'm trying to think it was a Twitter story or using um, Slack or one of those sorts of things. So they they had a short few paragraph long story um, with a bit of a legacy theme. And they sort of dotted the different sentences of this story around the organisation. So whoever had sentence one had to find it and put it up. And then 
whoever had sentenced to had to kind of then go on and add to the story. And she said she just became like a really, everyone was, I suppose it was that period, I think it might have been coming up to Christmas and, you know, when it's slightly kind of, uh, um, you know, people are kind of looking for a bit of fun, aren't they, at, at that time. And, and people got really engaged in this I story. So, so you've got one piece of the jigsaw. Yeah. And, and you just, it's in, it means very little. Until but you, you have to go and find yeah. someone else and you're, as a tip, that's, a brilliant it's metaphor. Such a good idea, wasn't it? And uh, again, all of this being other people's ideas that I'm, uh, <laughs> um, you know, stealing for future use. But uh, she said, you know, people got really excited, and you know, it got to a point there was a bit of a sort of hold up. So it was like, you know, who's got sentence six? You know, because <laughs> they really wanted to see what happened mm-hmm. in the story. So uh, yeah, so you know, some really fun sort of um, internal engagement. Um, but particularly, I also loved the idea that um, one hospice had um, essentially someone dressing up as a giant cat. <laughs> With the <laughs> idea being, uh, has the cat got your tongue, i.e., you know, you're not having legacy conversations, uh, and just kind of went around the office dressed as this cat and, uh, you know, crashed into meetings. And, and I think, you know, these sorts of things really sort of help to overcome that other barrier to legacies that it's just a bit boring you know people think oh it's you know it's legal it's death it's you know why would i want to get engaged with it because it's just not fun mm. it's actually doing these really sort of fun transgressive things um yes i i, I love this and it would uh, fit really beautifully in, into to a theme i've been really interested in the last three years to which i call creating wow moments yes, where you create yes. surprise or delight just beyond what normal fundraising does, what what normal colleagues or what normal donors would remotely expect mm. you to do. That's precisely why, if you can take a deep breath and be that bit more bold, bit more bespoke, bit more creative, it adds up to a bigger difference because finally you cut through and, mm. and especially if it's playfully is done with the right tone, yeah. then people are less likely to just write it off as a mere gimmick if, if your tone is right and there's something about the hook, about something mm. about the reason for doing this particular fun, different treatment that is more noticeable, that does in due course make sense yeah. to the overall message you've got, the main story you're trying to get a tr- across, whatever you're trying to promote within your organisation, our experience is, is far better to take that risk mm. and cut through than take the risk of just sending around more emails yeah. and doing another dull five minutes in some team meetings saying all the things that people expected mm. you to say. Now, you can get it wrong. You can do this tactic and it just be pure gimmick and there's no substance to it. You don't explain why you did it. Mm. And then I understand why people would, you know, at, at some level be justified in their cynicism. You interrupted their, their mm. team meeting and, you know... You should be back at work rather than dressing up as a cat. But my view is if you if you think it through and uh, you get both the concept and the tone right, mm. then the number of people who think it was a mere gimmick are relatively few and the number of people who are really pleased you did it yeah. tend to be high. Yeah. And I suppose we think about those wow moments for our donors, but not necessarily for our colleagues. And I suppose just... You've made me think overall, there's so many parallels between, you know, we have an external marketing plan or an external fundraising plan. And actually, if you're going to do this stuff well, you need something that mirrors that internally. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely my observation about it, especially if success in growing legacies overall comes from us making better use of these high quality relationships that all the different people in the charity have mm. with their supporters rather than legacy fundraising being a thing that happens six times a year when there is a legacy mailing. Mm. It's just absolute madness, I think, to keep sending that stuff out and not be having chats with the people you're regularly meeting anyway because they're running a marathon Mm. for you. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose the other really good point is just, um, and again, applies to fundraising overall, doesn't it, really, but telling stories. Because there are so many brilliant stories around legacies, you know, around the people that have left them, around the slightly unusual gifts sometimes, around their motives, uh, around what you've done with the money. So, you know, just keep telling those stories again, as you would externally, but keep telling those sort of stories internally. Um, and actually, National Trust shared with us, they had, um, there's just a really nice uh, billboard, I suppose you'd call it, in um, one of their properties where it said, you know, are you 
curious about what's going on in the um the arbor let's call it i'm getting i'm misquoting again slightly but you know actually we're replanting all the trees and this is because we've had a legacy to pay for it so um yeah you know encouraging people internally um to use those well telling those stories to your colleagues and then encouraging your colleagues to tell those stories to potential donors as well because again what a lovely gentle way of promoting legacies in a you know non-scary fashion is just to tell these little stories about you know what your organization has had and what it's done with it and what an amazing difference they make and then claire in terms of that third theme of measurement what did you notice from this research project that the more successful organizations were doing well, it was a little bit of a mixed bag, whereas the other two themes, there seemed to be some really clear ideas coming out. Um, in terms of measurement, there was, I suppose, almost two schools of thought. So um, in one school of thought, they were saying, well, actually, you know, we set quite hard targets for our colleagues, um, often around, you know, you have to have X number of legacy conversations a month or a year or whatever it might be. So e- not counting pledges, but please, yeah. please record the number of times per month you, you mentioned legacies to mm. your, your supporter. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas some other organisations, it was a much softer measurement. And so um, I I was interested, I suppose, in the one organisation where they said, um, actually, what I measure is, you know, the amount of leaflets and pens and you know, legacy marketing collateral that is ordered, because actually that's a sign that my colleagues are out there sharing this stuff, having conversations. And so for, for her and her organisation, she thought that was more effective than trying to uh, very specifically target colleagues. Although, again, um, so I, I'm kind of um, slightly torn on this as well, really, as to, to whether the hard or the soft measurement is the, the better way to go. Although one organisation was saying, well, actually, um, by making sure people do have targets and measuring the, the conversations that they're having, that then really helps over the longer term, because actually I can, um, you know, in a couple of years' time, five, six years time perhaps, be able to sort of go back to people and say, you know, we're starting to get these legacies in. And actually that was a result of the conversation that you had. So to be able to sort of close that feedback loop, which again, I thought was a very astute point. But I think it probably depends a bit uh, on the culture of your organisation as well, whether you know the the sort of levels of targeting people have even to whether you know legacies will fit into that. So I guess it's it's finding a, a, a route forward whether the sort of the hard or the softer measurements are better for you, really. I think. Mm. And uh, just before we f- finish this bit of the conversation, you've talked about those three themes mm-hmm. having, I, I guess. Your original PhD was all about why people give, and then this particular piece of research was what is it that organisations do when mm. they're more holistic in their approach? Any last idea we we may not have yet stressed from this research project mm. that you think is useful for the listener to to know about? Do you know, one thing I'm going to just add, which applies to all of the above, really, the, you know, the people, the stories, the measurement, um, is just keep going as well. So I think sometimes where these efforts fail is where it's, and I think I mentioned in the previous episode, actually, someone's just brought in to do some training and that's it. You know, then the organisation expects this amazing transformation, but it's a real long term process. And I guess it can it can feel quite difficult to constantly be banging this drum. But again, what someone said to me, um, which I thought, again, was a really, you know, it's really sort of stuck in my mind was, the point at which you're becoming really bored at talking about this is the point at which it's just starting to register with your audience. So you think your colleagues are absolutely sick of you talking about legacies. And actually, it's only just starting to, you know, even kind of make it onto their radar, really. You know, the last time you had the conversation, they were just thinking about what they were going to have for lunch. So you've just got to keep banging on at it and doing the hard graft. You know, it's not a one shot exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very wise words. And I've heard that advice on all the different topics I have on this podcast mm. that it's it's every now and again you get a lucky early win but the more normal change curve and results curve is about incremental gains mm. and the early part of the graph you <laughs> the universe does not often send you a ma- major early results it often takes longer than you think it possibly should but mm. that's the time when you keep going. And if you can, then in due course, the, you reach the tipping point and suddenly this becomes more and more A, normal, and B, also results start to show as well. Absolutely. So, Claire, 
if people wanted to get in touch with you, uh, are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Twitter? Um, I'd love to hear what they think about this episode. Uh, so uh, if they want to find you on, on Twitter or LinkedIn, how could they do that? Uh, so yes, I do uh, tweet lots of uh, legacy related things. So uh, come and uh, join the conversation. I'm on uh, the worst Twitter name to actually say out loud because uh, it's Clary Jane R. So Claire with an I and a Y on the end. Jane R. Fantastic. So we, we would love to hear what you think about this. Do get in touch. We'll we'll get back to you. Claire, if, if people want your advice, what's your website? Oh yes, legacyfundraising.co.uk. Fantastic. Claire, I've learned so much today. This is such an important topic. Whether what we're trying to do is legacies or anything mm, else that absolutely. actually our organisation needs to be more holistic about rather than silo-ish about. Uh, I've learned a lot. Thank you ever so much for sharing your ideas and I look forward to talking to you again. Bye-bye. Thank you and thank you everybody for sharing them with me in the first place. Bye-bye, Claire. Bye. Bye. So there you go. I hope you found Claire's insights useful. As usual, on the blog and podcast section of my Bright Spot fundraising website, I'll put a summary of the key ideas and a transcript of the interview, as well as a link to the excellent book Legacy and In-Memory Fundraising, which Claire co-edited with Sebastian Wilberforce. If you're interested in other ideas to do with legacies, then as well as checking out Claire's website, I recommend you have a listen to episode 28 of this podcast, which is also with Claire, about how to have a conversation with a charity supporter about legacy giving. And if you like the podcast, please remember to subscribe today. And it would be fantastic if you could share it on with your colleagues or just take a moment to leave a kind review wherever you get your podcasts, which really helps other fundraisers to find this free resource. If you want to get in touch, we're both on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Claire is at Clary Jane R with a capital J and a capital R. And I am at Woods underscore Rob. If you'd like more ideas to help you succeed during the pandemic, then do check out my ebook, Power Through the Pandemic, which gives seven key strategies to help you raise money, even now through major donors, corporates and trusts. You can download it for free from brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash power. Finally, thank you so much for listening today. And until the next time, good luck with all your fundraising efforts. Hold up. 